Now then, I'm going to take you back um, several years ago as a young, uh, still 17-year-old young man down in western Kentucky, um, knowing uh, we don't have any old people in here. Anyone ever hear Walter Winchell? Yes. Okay. Now, I came back into depression. We had an old Silvertone radio. We didn't have electricity. And we had a body, had a uh, battery operated uh, old Silvertone radio. And I was hearing Walter Winchell tell about the Marines in the Pacific. Many of them, many thousands, were given their lives for our country, our freedom. And I had already registered for the draft. They had my number, but my number hadn't come up. And I tell my dad, I don't want to wait and be drafted. I think I want to join the Marines. And I go to the draft board and tell them, I want to volunteer. I want you to call me up. And they did so, go to San Diego, boot camp after boot camp, uh, sea school, sea school, meant that I would be seagoing. So I go up to San Francisco and for the first time see the ship that I'm going to join, the big, twice the length of football fields, 610 feet long. That's to be my home for the duration of the war. She had already been in combat, but I was aboard her for, ten battle st uh, for six of the 10 battle stars. And um, I recall uh, uh, when I go to San Francisco and see that big ship, uh, well, you can't imagine my thinking, a country boy, a farm boy from western Kentucky, seeing that big ship, and that, yes, would be my home for the duration of the war. Soon after aboard, we were at Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Sea Battle of the Philippine Seas, I have to tell you that our task force, uh, 58, that day we shot down 403 Japanese aircraft. Then I was down at Peleliu, I was at Iwo Jima, uh, three hour strikes on Tokyo, uh, and then, uh, uh, oh, I was at Okinawa. It was at Okinawa that we were there before the second Marines and the 27th Army came in before they landed and making uh, the beachheads to where they could land. But in so doing, uh, we were at the wrong place at the right time. And a Jap plane, I can hear the boats and blowing, the, blowing his uh, call to tell Sad emergency condition in the anti-aircraft battery. We knew that he was talking in a hurry because he was in a hurry to get the message out. And they said about 11 seconds later, the plane hit our ship and a big gaping hole through all the way through the ship, went through the mess hall, through the sleeping and berthing compartment, went through the water distillering plant, went out the bottom of the ship and exploded on that big shaft that turns those screws. And um, because of that, we had to, had to block some of the ship uh, so that uh, uh, all that water wouldn't come in. And, and uh, the Navy came, and Seabees or someone, and they put some kind of a patch over that big hole. and. Uh, we hobbled back to the States for repair, and um, it took some time to get it repaired, but I remember um, uh, one day then uh, uh, they tell us that we were to uh, head back to the forward area, and we look out on the dock, and there was Navy Marine Corps brass out there, much, much, and we knew that something was up, and um, we inquired, is what's, what's happening? Well, uh, momentarily, uh, 
uh, some big truck pulled up and they take off a big, big box. Now it was big. I often say it's like my fish story. It gets bigger every time I tell it. It was big. And uh, I noticed that every place that a screw was in it, it was countersunk and kind of a wax or something over that. No one was to bother that, touch that. My Marine captain, I was a corporal. He said, Corporal Harrell, I happened to have the watch at that time. Corporal Harrell followed that into the port hangar deck and stationed a guard to guard that. Uh, captain Parks, what are we guarding? We don't know. We didn't know. Uh, to get ahead of the story and say, uh, we didn't know that we had Little Boy, the code name for the atomic bomb that we dropped at uh, Hiroshima. And then momentarily there was a, a couple of proposed to be Air Force officers coming aboard our ship. And we thought it's strange Air Force, you know, coming aboard. And they had a little canister in a metal cage with a padlock on it. And um, a couple of sailors came and they would kind of put a rod through that, put it on their shoulders and take it up to the a forward area, and again, my Marine captain said, uh, uh, Harold, follow them up to a certain uh, Admiral Spruance was not aboard, his flag was not aboard, and so there were some vacant places, and take them up to a certain place, and, and uh, that's where they will go and, and station a guard to guard whatever they have there, and uh, okay, who are they, and uh, what are we guarding? Okay, let me take you back to uh, July the 16th, July the 16th, 45, when uh, we were leaving San Francisco. Uh, they say that we stopped under the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, why did we stop? Whether we did or didn't, it's not too important. But what happened at about that time in Los Alamos, New Mexico, the first successful atomic bomb was exploded. Now, we have the components now of Little Boy, and uh, here we are. We're, we're setting sail. And so uh, uh, I recall that, uh, uh, okay, uh, we're wondering. Uh, uh, we've been in combat now for a good time, and then here we are. We're we're going back uh, to the forward area, and we have a top secret cargo, and uh, we're to go to uh, Tinian Island. Now, Tinian Island is only 5,300 miles, and here we are in a heavy cruiser, and uh, we are unescorted, and uh, and uh, we set sail, and. Um, I know that um, we stopped at Pearl. We took on fuel and some supplies, and then we still head out for uh, uh, Tinian Island. And um, uh, I recall I happened to be on the watch, and uh, the officer of the deck came to Captain McVeigh, and uh, he said, Cap, we've got to slow this thing down said, we're going uh, um, as fast as it will go, and we're going to burn up the motors. And, well, maybe Captain McVeigh knew the cargo that we were escorting, but I recall that he looked at the officer of the deck and uh, just uh, kind of this expression, keep the same speed and we kept the same speed. We delivered that um, July 26. 10 days, 5,300 mile in a heavy cruiser. We've delivered it. Now our ship, the flagship of Admiral Spruitz, and the flag was not aboard, but we knew that America would be landing some two million troops on Japan. We knew that Britain would maybe join us with a million troops. Okay, we knew that uh, uh, Japan was in our gun sights. 
And so uh, from Guam then, uh, Captain McVeigh asked for an escort to escort us to the Philippines. And uh, they tell us that uh, you don't need an escort. Well, they knew that the Indianapolis does not have any underwater sound gear. We could not detect a submarine down there. And they knew also that just uh, three or four days before that we lost to Underhill, a destroyer, we lost 129 boys. They don't tell him that you need an escort. They tell us you don't need an escort. Um, they don't tell him that we've broken the Japanese code. Um, may I say, could you believe that we partly had broken the code prior to Pearl Harbor? Let me back up a bit and I'll try to get back to this. But before Pearl Harbor, on Friday, before December 7, the Indianapolis was in Pearl. We had married men, their wives were there, they were on leave, now we're not in combat, and uh, uh, at least a third of the crew is not aboard, and the good captain then got on the speaker, and he says, prepare the ship to get underway in two hours. Okay, and the boys that were aboard, they wondered, we can't do that. Uh, and okay, the ship was the flagship of uh, President Roosevelt too, and his big ornate bed, you know, was aboard the ship. And uh, well, we can't get underway, but they did, they got underway. And then that was on Friday on Sunday morning, though, word came, the Japs are bumming Pearl. And uh, now the Indianapolis heads back. Okay, what do we do with Roosevelt's uh, uh, ornate bed and so on? Well, let me say, it went overboard. Now, I was not aboard at the time, but they tell me that they got rid of everything and uh, made ready, but when they got back to Pearl, um, uh, the Japs had been there and the devastation that we all know about. Okay, now then, let me take you back to where I think I was. Okay, we have been uh, to uh, um, Tinian Island and we've delivered our cargo. We're going to the Philippines to prepare for the main invasion of Japan and um, the Navy are not telling us the truth. They are not telling us, you need an escort. The Taman group of submarines are out there. We lost a ship four days before. Uh, and you have no underwater sound gear. You can't detect a submarine out there. But we were going to send you out unescorted. And may I say, they basically said, and when you send an SOS, we're going to ignore it. And we sent SOSs, and they were ignored. And we have proof that those SOSs went out by battery, and the experts checked that, and they said, if this happened, you did actually send an SOS, but they were ignored. Okay, now then, here we are. We're... Uh, we're on our way now from Guam uh, to the Philippines to prepare for the main invasion of Japan. And that was um, on maybe July the 20s. Well, we delivered our cargo the 26th. Uh, Cap McVeigh is in Pearl or in Guam on the 27th. And we think maybe that we were partly uh, on with the way on the 28th, but on the night of the 29th, um, we are making our way someplace uh, ac across Route Petty to the Philippines, and we 
you know, we have slowed down to 17 knots and uh, uh, it's 110 degrees uh, and that sun, you know, reaching down on that steel ship that has no air conditioning and a good captain got on the speaker that evening and he says, you know, uh, I realize that uh, we have uh, delivered our cargo and we have slowed down and uh, you're welcome to uh, get your blanket and uh, come out topside and make you a pallet right out on the open deck. So when I got off a of watch that night, um, I go below deck and I, uh, I get my uh, K-Puck jacket. No, I don't need that. I need my blanket. And uh, I go topside and um, uh, the night before, I had slept in the life raft on the top of number one turret, the big eight inch guns. But on the 29th, um, there were only two sergeants still aboard, part of ship's company, and there were three corporals only and uh, we three corporals were told that uh, you are promoted to sergeant today. Okay, that was July the, the 29th. But what happened about 14 minutes past midnight that night changed that. Commander Hoshimoto was waiting somewhat at the crossroads and um, he was loaded for bear. His little periscope was sticking out and he was picking us up. We could not detect him, but he knew that we were there. And uh, so we are sailing along, and uh, about 14 minutes past midnight on July the 30th, he tells the crew, uh, you know, they can see that uh, he has uh, something in his target and he tells them to stand by, code red, um, and he has two human two uh, torpedoes. Two men would be in a motorized uh, torpedo that could not be recovered, but two were in one, two wanted to get in another, but he had six torpedoes loaded, and so when we uh, got in his uh, area, then... Uh, um, he announced code red, far, far, far. About every two seconds he says that he fired one of the six torpedoes. Now, I had gotten off a of watch, as I said, at, at 12, and I went down and got my blanket, and I went topside, and um, I uh, didn't sleep in that life raft, I slept right down on the deck of the ship because it was kind of a no-no to sleep in a life raft. Uh, and I'd made sergeant that day, and so I'm sleeping right down on the deck. And that first torpedo hit, um, and it cut the bow of the ship off. Well, how do you know it cut the bow of the ship off? How does anyone know uh, unless someone tells them that they saw something that tells them that. And that first torpedo, I've told through the years, that first torpedo cut the bow of the ship off. I said, there's a couple of 20 millimeters right up there. And that part was cut off. Um, that's about 30, 35 feet wide or so at that point, about 35, maybe even as much as 40 feet. I said that bow of the ship was cut off, and well, it's in my book, I, my first book, I, I was in 38 states, and I tell that story. My second book, I've been in some 43 states, I still tell that story. You know what? They found the ship, finally they find it. You know where it is? Three and a half mile down in the, in the Philippine Sea. You know where the bow of the ship is? A mile from the ship. And uh, 
I could say, remember, I told you so. And, uh, okay, now then, here we are. Commander Hoshimoto's fired um, his torpedoes. He's hit us with, uh, with two of them. The first cut the bow of the ship off. The second one was aft a little bit, nearly under the barrels, down in the magazine of number two turret, big eight-inch guns. And that magazine now explodes and blows everything up. And that's close to the marine compartment. No doubt there's several of we marines down in that compartment. If so, anyone below deck in the first hundred yards of the ship, they didn't stand a chance because those four big screws are pushing, 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 and all of that water is coming in, and all the hatches topside are sealed off, and uh, anyone below deck in the first hundred yards of that ship, uh, they don't stand a chance. And now that I've seen the pictures since they found the ship, uh, you know, I can see where it was cut off. I can see that bow with that... 35 on it, the Indianapolis. I can see the literally the guts of the ship for, I, I would say, uh, probably 100 feet or so. You can see that there's m no metal on the, the keel of the ship there on the starboard side. You can literally just see, you know, everything on the inside, and may I say, you'll see it uh, 100 years from now, yes. No one can go down and bother anything. They can only take a motorized robot or something to even make pictures to see what the ship might look like. Okay, now then, uh, uh, we have received the torpedoes, and I uh, know that uh, the ship is sinking, and I know that I've got to get back midship because any time there's emergency, that boats and blows that whistle and he tells you that certain things are happening, then you go to your emergency station. And so I knew that my emergency station was back midship, back on the quarter deck. And so as I start back to the quarter deck, I realized, number one, I could feel uh, all of that water coming in uh, and I really believe that to some degree in feeling that and, and hearing uh, the reaction of even things topside, I didn't know what was happening down below. But later I realized what did happen down below. And so I have to say I'm seeing, feeling, hearing uh, all the bulkheads down below breaking. And now I'm to go to the quarterdeck midship to receive orders to, as to what I'm to do. But as I start after, I have to go down on the high side, on the port side, because we're already listening to the starboard. And as I start after, I, I see that there are officers coming out of many of their compartments there on the main deck forward. And they were, most of them were just in their night skivvies, and they were flash burned. Or maybe they'd touched their hand on a hot bulkhead and left the skin of the hand on the bulkhead, and they are pleading for someone to give them some assistance, but that's not my responsibility. I'm making my way to my emergency station, realizing I don't have a life jacket. My life jacket is down in the marine compartment. And so uh, when I get to the quarter deck, my Marine Lieutenant is there, and I see a new supply of uh, canvas bags of new life jackets and ask Lieutenant Stauffer permission to cut down those life jackets. His response was, not until we get word to abandon ship. The ship is sinking. In fact, by now, the first hundred yards of the ship is underwater on the starboard side. I get to the quarter deck. Uh, normally, the quarter deck would be eight feet above the water line. There's water on the quarter deck. And my Marine Lieutenant is there, permission to cut down those KPOC jackets. His response was, not until we get word to abandon ship. Well, we didn't know it, but all communication was knocked out. 
all electrical power was out. Um, only a battery operated uh, SOS even could go out. And we're waiting for the captain to announce abandoned ship. He had sent an officer below deck to check and see if there's any possibility, but that person that he sent, he never returned. And um, so finally, uh, Captain McVeigh uh, says that he came out to the highest place of the crow's nest there to announce abandoned ship, but in all the noise, someone hears it, someone passes that on, and I can hear it like an echo down on the quarter deck. Uh, you could just imagine, you know, uh, abandon ship, abandon ship, abandon ship, and we get word to abandon ship. And by now, uh, the first hundred yards of the ship is under water on the quarter deck that is eight feet above water line. And so we're desperate, desperate. I have a KPOC life jacket. I put it on like a vest, knowing that word, I'm waiting for word, and word finally comes. And um, so you go to the high side, and you get a hold of that cable, and you look out into the blackness of the night, and you see all of that half inch of oil on the water. You're going to dive into that. You're going to go into that. And um, um, may I say that there's times when you pray, and there's times when you pray, and there's a difference. As I held on to that rail, I'm looking out into eternity and uh, realizing this may be the end of life, but I'm praying. And may I say, and I knew to whom I was praying. Yes, and I knew that he was answering me. I knew that there was no audible voice, but I was getting a voice, and I was understanding, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, as maybe just a young Sunday school boy, just a young teenager. But uh, after I had been called into the Marine Corps, uh, you know, I had decisions to make. I remember going to church on the Lord's Day morning, August the 1st, 1943, so still... Uh, before my 18th birthday. And uh, may I say this to maybe some of you, maybe more than a few. I don't know the number of times as a young man that my dad, mom, we walked a mile to church. We had no automobile. Uh, maybe a wagon with a team of horses, you know, sometime to make a trip somewhere. But I walked to church every time the doors were open. And the school across the street from the church, uh, when they would have some kind of a special meeting, uh, they would have dinner on the ground, and the school would let out and go to those meetings, and we'd have a good meal and so on. And many times... Uh, some good lady would uh, see me and knowing who I was, and when an invitation was given, would ask me, you know, you need to go forward and give the pastor your hand and so and trust the Lord. Well, I don't know the number of times that I listened to that good advice, and I went forward, but may I say, I never trusted the Lord until the first day of August 1943, when I had already joined the Marine Corps, and I'm to go to San Diego, and I'm praying, and I go to Memorial Baptist Church in Murray, Kentucky, and the pastor preached a message and gave an invitation. I sat, he came and talked to me, and he knew me, and he knew my spiritual condition, and he said, Ed, 
you need to trust the Lord today, don't you? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, a God who cannot lie, he makes you a promise and uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, thou shalt be saved. Do you believe that, Ed? And I said, yes, I believe it. He said, now, did the Lord save you? And I said, no. He said, God who cannot lie is making you a promise. If you will believe, spiritually believe, he'll save you. And he went over that two or three times. And then finally, I said, Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And here today, right now, I trust you as my own personal Savior. And may I say, when I trusted the Lord there, I knew, I knew, I knew that I was a new creation in Christ Jesus. I knew, and I've never questioned that. Now then, as I'm holding on to that rail, as I'm looking out into the blackness of the night and knowing that this is the end of life, I knew to whom I was praying and I knew that he was saying, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I didn't know I'm going to be out there for four and a half days swimming with the sharks. I believe, though, that I'm going to make it. I'm holding on to that rail, and I'm praying, and I tell the Lord, Mom and Dad back home, older sister and a younger sister, six younger brother, brothers, Lord, I don't want to die. And I made the Lord more promises than I have ever been able to live up to. He reminds me of some of them, but He's been faithful to me these years. May I say, likewise, as I'm praying, um, I tell him, there's a certain brunette back in Murray, Kentucky, uh, that promised to wait for me. And may I say, and she waited. She waited after this whole story now, uh, July the 25th, 1947. She became uh, Mrs. Edgar Harrell, my wife. She's just had her 92nd birthday this past July. We celebrated our 71st wedding anniversary. Now, that's my story. Now, I'm leaving the ship. I've got something and I, back home that's calling me. Mom and dad, brother, sister, family, and that brunette that waited for me. Now... I leave that ship, the bow is under, it is sinking, it's leaving me. I see that fantail high in the air, boys jumping off, jumping into those screws that are still turning. I saw it as it went completely under. Now, I swim away from that ship, I jump in the water, feet first, my Kapok jacket came up over my head, and now a half inch of oil, and I try to get my head above that oil, and of course I'm just plastered with oil. In your face, in your eyes, in your nostrils, yes, even in your mouth, in your ears, yes. And uh, I, I'm swimming away from the ship and see her when she completely goes under. Join the first little group out there, not knowing how many has gotten off or who, where, or what. Where are the others? But I joined a little group of about 80. And uh, just as soon as I got into the little group, I could see that many of them didn't have life jackets, and they're hanging on to a buddy. Uh, some of them were injured, and that didn't make it even through the first night. I, as a Marine, I wondered, any Marines, any Marines? I found two Marines. One was I was his squad leader, and he hadn't been aboard ship long, Spooner, Miles Spooner. The other had come aboard maybe at Pearl when we came through and or even at Guam. And I, I find him and he's wounded, badly wounded. I tried to encourage him, but what can you do other than to hang in there? 
help is on the way. We knew that SOS is supposed to have gotten out. And I tried to caress him the best that I could. But he basically didn't want me to hardly touch him because he was in pain. But I'm trying to encourage him. And uh, after, I'd say, maybe a couple of hours, and then he's gone into eternity. And then uh, I begin to check uh, others and do the best that you can, you know, with boys that don't have life jackets. And then uh, wait for morning to come. Morning comes, and we had company. At any time that first day, you could look out and you could see a big fin out there swimming around. And uh, even though they aren't attacking you, uh, you know, you can imagine what they're doing to you. Shark, shark, shark. And they, out of fairness to the sharks, they were not attacking our group. But it isn't long till someone maybe has been injured and uh, maybe he's, uh, he's out of his head and he sees an oasis out there. He can imagine, may I say, I too, I too could see things that did not exist. I could hear things that wasn't there and um, had trouble many times. But to see a buddy tells you that he sees something out there and he's swimming out to that oasis out there and all of a sudden you look and you hear a blood-curdling scream. You see that body taken under and sharks, 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 blood, blood, blood. You dare not to go and check your buddy, but when you do check him, you find out that the bottom torso is gone or he's disemboweled. Now that's happening multiple, multiple times. Um, even, even uh, oh, more so the second day, but even the first day we're losing boys. And then my buddy Spooner then had gone into the water head first. And if you could imagine all of that oil in your eyes, how are you going to get it out? You aren't. And then uh, you look up at that sun, 110 degrees, and that salt water, if you looked at the sun long enough, it might turn to powder, and you rub your eyes. And even uh, before the second day, my buddy Spooner uh, couldn't see. His eyes, with that oil, with that salt, and so on, and he was he basically was praying to die. He wanted to die. He wanted to commit suicide. And uh, since I was his squad leader, I knew something about Spooner. Spooner had been shanghaied out of three organizations before he uh, appeared uh, to the Indianapolis and uh, was accepted to come aboard. And the good, my good captain, uh, Marine captain, said, Harold, you're... Uh, you're one man short in your squad. Uh, you inherit Spooner. And I uh, said, Spooner's been shanghaied out of three different outfits. And uh, you have to take charge of him. You cannot allow him to bring reproach on the Marine Corps to board this year. I don't care what you have to do. He even said, I don't care if you have to throw him overboard, but do not allow him to do anything to bring reproach on the Marine Corps aboard this ship. Now that's Spooner. So Spooner now, uh, I'm, his, I'm his squad leader. We had many, many good heart-to-heart -heart talks early, early on. Now then, this is Spooner in uh, that group now. And I'm tying him on to me because he can't see and I'm fastening him on to me and he wants to commit suicide. And I turn his back to mine and I lash him onto me to where he can't get to it to get off. He was committed to just ending life. Okay, now then, let's go to through that first day. Shark, shark, shark. Many boys were injured. Go through the second night. Uh, the second night after the first day. Have a night before the day. And then... Uh, hyperthermia at night. I happen to 
have gone to bed, so to speak, that night with my dungarees on. I took off my shoes. I had my blanket. I wrapped my blanket over me, and uh, that saved me from that first explosion. But here I am now. I'm, I'm, I'm swimming, swimming uh, here, and uh, uh, that second day now, I'm thirsty. Have you ever been really thirsty? Really? Really? Has your mouth ever, tongue ever swollen in your mouth and you can hardly talk and, uh, and uh, you are desperate, desperate for water. Your lips are all parched open. They're bleeding. That has all that oil in them. They're burning. That salt water getting in that and them bleeding, and you're desperate for water, and uh, you see a little rain cloud coming over. Look, 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 it's raining. Well, you think about praying. You pray. Yes, you pray for water, and that little rain cloud, like it does here in Missouri and Kentucky and Tennessee, where I'm from, yes, that little rain cloud coming over, and uh, you thank the Lord for that water, and it's raining, but how much water can you catch in your big mouth? Not much. You take those greasy hands, and maybe you cup some of that water, and you get a little bit of water, and you swallow that. Okay, a little oil with it. Okay, it goes down in the tummy, and you're thankful for a little bit of water, but it isn't very long until that says, we've got to come out, and it comes out. And now, may I say, for four and a half days, I had a taste of a little bit of water, but didn't keep it very long. Okay, now then, here I am the second day. Now, there was some 80, but we're losing boys just every little bit. Uh, dehydration, uh, hypothermia. If you don't have clothing on, I would just say, just think of this. You get out here in 85 degree weather uh, without any clothing on and a good breeze up and uh, now that body temperature, you know, that 98, you know, it drops down and it gets down uh, let's say it gets down 85 degrees. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, 84, it's all over. Hypothermia. And what can you do? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing to protect you. And so we're losing, boys. Hypothermia. Uh, dehydration. Uh, that 110 degree weather. And uh, so we're losing boys just every little bit. Okay, now let me bring it to the third day at noon. When I say losing boys, third day at noon, how many did we have earlier? About 80. And we are losing them fast. Just every little bit now. You could be down in a swell and you look up there, maybe six foot swell, look up there, and there is a decomposed body up there. And then that swell breaks, and it breaks pretty fast, you know. About every 22 seconds, you have a new, new swell, you know. And uh, so that body comes down, and now you can't even tell that hardly that he's a human. I mean, the flesh by now is coming off. And he comes down and he bumps into you and he leaves part of that residue on you and you're going to wear that. Yes. And so the, here we are. We are struggling. We're struggling. And um, so the third day at noon, there are 17 of us. And I can recall that day so vividly today I have my buddy Spooner having tied on to me, and there are 15 sailors, and 
I can hear this one big old Texan uh, said uh, something like this. We've got to pray. Uh, we see our B-29s flying over, bombing Tokyo. We can see that trail up there, but no one's looking for us. And um, so we are desperate. And um, I can hear this sailor says, we've got to pray. He says, uh, we can't make it unless we can get closer to the Philippines uh, unless someone spots us. And he says this, I've got a son back home I've never seen. May I say, he never ever got to see his son. He's praying, but we are in our KPOC life jackets. And uh, what would you do when your KPOC life jacket is so water-soaked that... Uh, you know, you can't just ra- relax. If you do, you're gone. You've got to fight. You've got to continue on. There's no quitting. There's no giving up. If so, you're gone. And that's all you have to do. I often say, it's much easier to die than it is to live. Just give up and, you know, you can just drown it a little bit. But... How long can you swim Uh, until you give out? And when you give out, you keep swimming, yes. And so here we are. We're struggling. And uh, um, uh, our old KPOC jackets now, uh, we have them on. But you you can't relax. If you relax a bit, you know you're underwater. And uh, so you've got to... Try and this one sailor, I can hear him and see him. Uh, you know, God, if you're out there, I don't want to die. And, and then he says, "Fellows, let's take our jackets off and pull them down under us and sit in them." Okay, we tried that. Now that same old kabog jacket, you put it down under your buttocks. Now it has the same buoyancy. The only thing, it's a little further down on the body. And your head might be two or three inches more out of the water as you, as you swim. You quit swimming, and it's all over. You've got to. There's no, I can hear this one sailor from, from North Carolina. He asked him, what would his advice be to anyone? And he said, never, never, never give up. If you give up, you're gone. You've got to keep swimming. And so here we are. Here we are. We're struggling. There's 17 of us. And we're seating in our k jackets. And then uh, we came up on a swell and uh, we said, uh, Hey, look, look, look. Over there someplace, look. That looks like there's some movement, there's some body there, and that looks like a little raft. A little raft, yes. And we could holler at them, they back at us, and it takes some time, that little raft got closer and closer. We could see that there were five sailors around a little makeshift of a raft, and they were coming into our group, and just by voice, you know, so as they came into our group. We were looking at that little raft, and uh, no one was on the raft. No, not a soul was on the raft. Five sailors around it. But as they came into our group, uh, we saw what they had on that raft. They had old k jackets that they had taken off of boys that had already expired. And you can take that old k jacket, and two men can take that Squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it. Like I say to you ladies, you know that old sponge won't hold any more water. You squeeze it out, it'll hold more water. That old K-Pop jacket, you squeeze that out, put it up in that hot sun, uh, it'll hold more water. And so they said, take off your K-Pop jackets. And they gave us a, a one that had been squeezed out. And uh, they want to know, anyone who wants to join us, um, we, we know that the Philippines is 
someplace there in the west. The sun goes down in the west. Uh, the Southern Cross, we know where that is, if it's, if it's light enough. And uh, anyone wants to join us? And I say to my buddy Spooner, I said, Spooner, I'm going to go with them. And Spooner responded, he said, Harold, if you go, I'm going with you. He had been tied on me. And so two, two Marines joined five sailors. Um, and uh, we didn't know it was another 500 mile to the Philippines. But you see what has been happening. And I say, I'm going to go with them, Spooner. And Spooner says, Harold, I'm going with you. Two Marines joined five sailors. And we think, yes, we're going to get closer to the Philippines. My 15 sailors said, you're crazy. You can't push that raft. And I said, yeah, but we can't make it here either. And when you see a group of 80 go down now to 17, it's time to do something. And when I saw that little raft, I, I just said, Lord, you're answering prayer. I'm going to go with that raft. Spooner, you're going with me. And I tied Spooner onto that raft so that he couldn't do what he had threatened to do, commit suicide. And so I'm up on that front corner, and they said, keep us going. Uh, uh, it was light enough to know which way was west, but keep us going in a straight direction. And so I'm up to where I could see, and I said, look, look, there's something out there. What is it? I don't know. And it's sometime when we're up, when it's up. And I said, look, that's just some debris out there, but what could that be? No one knows. And there was something that said, go and see what that might be. And so now I'm, I'm seated in that K-Bog jacket, but I, I pull that up around me and uh, I, I swim out to whatever that was out there. I get within six or eight feet of that old potato crate and I see those potatoes floating in that and to reach in in desperation to get a hold of that first potato and kind of in the agony of defeat as I squeeze that, it was solid on the inside but all of that rot squeezed through my fingers. And then to take that and peel it somewhat with my hands and then peel it with my teeth and spit out that rot. And there's a little bit of solid potato, so is some water and some food in that. And then my buddies see me, what is it? Rotten potatoes, they leave the raft, they join me. We had a little picnic, but all we had to eat was half rotten potatoes. That's all the food and water for four and a half days swimming in the Pacific. And then um, now we are heading toward the Philippines, we think. And so it isn't long we can see that, you know, the sun goes down in the west, but there's no sun. There's no Southern Cross. It's black. It's dark. It's dark. And here we are some time then that... Uh, that uh, fourth night before the fourth day and uh, we're we're desperate and then uh, again uh, we hear we hear voices and um, it isn't long till the voices get closer and closer and we're hollering at them and then uh, here a, a navy um, uh, uh, a Navy, I'm, I'm trying to think, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Charles McKissick. I knew him aboard ship. Oftentimes I was the captain's orderly, and he was the officer of the deck. And here, this is McKissick, and he became a, a I, I think you have to say, a buddy of mine, uh, not so much from his standpoint, but from my standpoint, a corporal and a lieutenant. But Oftentimes, as a greenhorn that I was, he would give uh, this corporal a message, and it was something unidentified at a certain distance, moving in a certain direction, and uh, uh, all of those things. And now for me to tell the captain what he told me, he would be sure that I repeated what he was telling me, and that's hard to do, you know, sometimes. And that's McKissick. 
at McKissick and one sailor. I saw in this one sailor what I'd seen so many times, and I often say, it's much easier to die than it is to live. You've got to struggle to live, but all you have to do to die is just relax. And I saw this sailor, his head had dropped in the water. I went over and I shook him and I said, hang in there, buddy. Help is coming, just hang in there a little while longer. Help is coming. And um, well, the second time I checked him, the same thing. The third time, too late, he's gone. So just McKissick and myself. And uh, McKissick had been to uh, the Philippines and uh, and uh, he asked me if I'd ever been there. No, he, he had. He was going to take me under wing once we made it there and so on. So we are struggling. We're struggling. And then, <clears throat> all of a sudden, I hear a plane. I hear a plane. Look, look, look. I see a plane. And what would you do? Well, uh, I'll tell you what you do. Impossible for him to see you. You wave. You, I don't know, you probably are hollering at him. You think that somehow, some way, you're going to attract his attention. But let me tell you who and what is up there. Lieutenant Gwynn flying that Ventura, a twin-engine plane with wheels. He's out on a search and destroy, looking for submarines. But he's having trouble with his radio antenna. The stabilizer on that antenna had come off, and that antenna was flipping back and forth. And he says that he had to stay up 5,000 feet or so even to reach Palu. And he talks to the co-pilot and said, take over control. I'm going to go and pull in that antenna. We've got to put a, a sock or a stabilizer on that or we can't reach base. And so the co-pilot takes over and Gwen goes back and somehow, some way, he opens a bomb bay door and he says that he glanced down at a split second and what did he see? I spoke to the 100th anniversary of Boy Scouts out in Spokane. I think there was some over 5,000 scouts. I said, you know what he saw? He saw your little mirror. Always take that with you. He saw the sun hit the oil, no doubt, off of our clothing. And when he saw that, he tells the co-pilot uh, and the crew, he gets on the speaker, and what he saw told him, there's a Jap sub down there. And he gets on the speaker, load the bombs, load the bombs, yes. And here we're excited. He's coming in. Yes, he was coming in. He's coming in because he was going to drop his bomb. His bombs are loaded. Let me take you back up there. He's flying about, uh, I don't know, a few thousand feet up there. He's looking forward of him. Uh, you know, let's say he's looking four miles out there. He's looking at two and a half mile out each side. That's 20 square mile, right? And to see a man's head down here, six by eight inches, impossible. But would you believe he saw it? He saw it. He saw the oil slick. And he gets on the speaker and he says, load the bombs, load the bombs. The bombs are loaded. We see him. Look, he's coming in. And he was coming in with his bombs loaded. And he came in. But as he gets down closer, closer, he sees boys scattered. He said they were scattered over 25 miles. He saw some boys maybe on floater nets. And he saw stragglers. He saw small groups. But he said... Any place that he saw a smaller group, he possibly saw more sharks than he saw boys. And so, so what can he do? Okay, uh, he came in. Now, how many others did he see before he saw McKissick and myself? I don't know. But I can see him today as he comes in and as he circles us two or three times. I can see Gwen in that cockpit and he's saying, I see you, 
don't know who you are, and then he go, has to go up a few thousand feet to reach Palu to tell them that ducks on the pond, who's ducks? No one knows. But he gets in touch with Adrian Marks, Lieutenant Marks, who's a pilot of a PBY, and tells Marks our coordinates out there and said there's sharks eating boys and there's more sharks than boys and boys are just scattered everywhere. And Marks tells him that's an hour and a half before I can even get there. But he says, we're on the way. And so sure enough, when he gets there, he passes over a, a destroyer and he tells them that ahead of you is boys scattered everywhere. Commander Clater above, uh, above the, the Doyle, I believe it was. And uh, so Marx finally uh, comes on uh, the scene and uh, as he gets on the scene, he sees boys, boys, boys scattered. He sees sharks, sharks, sharks attacking boys. Now, who's down there? No one knows. But he and the crew say, we've got to land. Is that Jap boys down there or American boys? No one knows. And um, so they basically all voted and said, we've got to land. And uh, thank goodness he disobeyed orders. And he set that big goose down. Now may I say I can see him today as he brings that plane down and I, I read about putting a, a plane in a stall and you put that plane in a stall and that tail of that aircraft is lower than any part of the plane. And as he came in, he caught the tail of that plane on one of those six or eight foot swells and pitched it and that right prop would never, and right motor would never run again. But he has one prop that will. He set it down. Now, he dares not to turn that one prop against a bank of water. What can he do? All he can do, he said, was just run the swells. And uh, oh, for the next good period of time, he's picking up stragglers. He Later, I knew he picked up McKissick. He finally picked me up. And now you can imagine, if you ever looked into a PBY, could you imagine him stacking 56 boys in there? Well, I've told that story that he picked up 56, and uh, the response is, that won't hold 56. Well, you stack them in there like a sack of feed, but you tie seven out on the wings. I've got a buddy down in Chattanooga that was one of the seven. Uh, he passed away in the last two months, but he was one of the seven. Now then, okay, now then. He sets that plane down and he picks up stragglers and it isn't long until uh, um, uh, here I'm aboard and uh, I see a certain blonde headed boy aboard and uh, I see those big sore eyes and I recognize my buddy Spooner and someone had given him a can of green beans and have you ever been so thirsty that you take a can of green beans and you knock a hole in the can and turned it up to drink some bean juice. That was Spooner. And I saw what Spooner was doing. Spooner, how about some of your bean juice? And uh, now you can imagine our condition. And uh, Spooner kind of told me where I could get off. He didn't know who I was. I said, Spooner, this is Harold. And uh, he kind of fell across a buddy to share some of the bean juice with me. Well, okay, now, he picked up 56. We were transferred aboard the Doyle. And as they transferred me aboard, I recall that they put me in a, in a like one of these metal stretchers, you know, and uh, put me in that. They bring me up vertically, and uh, they uh, take me down someplace, give me a kerosene or a diesel fuel bath, and get all of that oil off, and then any place that anything irritated rubs you, now that's, uh, that's uh, uh, comes a big water sore, and uh, if you clean that off, then you bleed, bleed, bleed. Well, that's my condition there. But now then, um, I, I think that uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of skip a few things here, but, uh, 
other than to say uh, 317 of the somewhat 1197 were rescued, and of that 317, today there are, I believe, the last few days, there may be 13 of us still living. I'm the only Marine. There were nine Marines that survived. 317 out of 1197 are 880 of my shipmates, the largest casualty at sea in the U.S. Navy. But our mission was to de deliver, uh, uh, could we say, little boy uh, dropped on Hiroshima August the 6th. Nagasaki, August the 9th. The Japs were aboard the Missouri, August the 12th. The war was over. A miscarriage of justice on the part of the Navy. We fought the Navy now for 50 years until the archives were open. And then finally, then we got a joint resolution and we got our good captain exonerated, but he had already put a bullet to his temple and pulled the trigger. Now, there's much more today since they found the Indianapolis, but it's been my uh, pleasure uh, these years now, the last several years, to travel the country telling of the greatest tragedy at sea in the history of the U.S. Navy, the sinking of the U.S. S. Indianapolis. Now, there's one thing that I want to read. I, many times I have uh, talked to Adrian Marks, uh, the PBY pilot that picked us up, and Lieutenant Gwynn that, that circled me and saw me down there and, and threw a life raft out for me to, to uh, come to, and I go to it, and it, would, it had a hole in it, and it would not support me. But um, they came to our reunions year after year after year, but this is from Marx telling about Gwen, the possibility uh, of him seeing us. What were the chances that Wilbur Gwen would fly a course which would take him directly over you? And what were the chances that his radio antenna would break while he was out on this mission? What were the chances that he would open his Bombay doors and look straight down momentarily? And what were the chances that he would look straight down on one of you. You didn't have a chance in a million. I know that most of you prayed a lot, and I know that some of you feel that it made a difference. Yes, yes. Wilbur Gwynn is a wonderful man and a fine pilot. He never said that he heard a voice speak to him, but was there an unseen hand upon his shoulder? Did he find you by pure chance? The odds against it are one in a million, nay, one in a billion. But somehow, he was chosen as the instrument to overcome these impossible astronomical odds. Wilbur Gwynn looked straight down at the split second that would become one of the great moments of history. I, as well as you, am proud to know him as a friend. Any sensible person knows that no one can swim for four and a half days and yet you did. For 40 years, I have reflected on the blind courage and the unbelievable, unbelievable greatness of spirit that I saw when each survivor was brought aboard my airplane. And I have been compelled by the evidence of my own eyes to believe in miracles. I believe in miracles, and yes, today, as a Christian, I believe in the providence of God, and he spared me not only then, but he's given me opportunity after opportunity to tell the story of the largest casualty at sea in the history of the U.S. Navy, and I thank you for being patient with me and hearing me today. So thank you, thank you, thank you so kindly. Pastor, thank you. Thank you.